And speaking of basketball, here's one joining us now, Kyle Macy, a Peru, Indiana native, national champion with the, the Wildcats of Kentucky back in 78. Uh, and <coughs> Kyle, thank you, first of all, for taking the time to join us. I know you're busy with all your duties and whatnot and traveling, and but uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah, I'm out Absolutely. here in Hutchinson, Kansas for the National Junior College Championship game on Saturday night. Or Man, I, I'm surprised that's not being held in Indiana because the Division Three National Championship was in, uh, I think, Evansville. The Divi No, that was up in Fort Wayne. The Division Two Championship was down in Evansville. Uh, Indianapolis was a site. You've got the women's NIT, or, uh, women's and men's NIT at Hinkle Fieldhouse. Uh, up as well. Did you play ever get to play in the Hinkle when you were in high school? Uh, not in high school, but when I was with the Pacers, that's where we always practiced. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, I did not know that. Very, very cool. How long were you with the Indiana Pacers? I was just there for one year. Yeah. How special was that for you being an Indiana native when you're coming out of Peru? Um, yeah, it's always fun to go back to your home state and play, although I didn't really get much opportunity to get on the court, so that didn't make it as fun as it could have been. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, we made the playoffs and whatever, didn't do real well. But, uh, it, you know, it was, it was a fun year to be cl that close to home. My parents got to come to a lot of games, those type of things. So it was fun. And, and people only understand, you, you come off of a, a national championship team uh, in which you beat Duke uh, and – Man, how, I wonder how how long had Mike Shashevsky been the coach at that time? Well, Bill Foster was the coach. It was oh, the, he was not the coach yet. Okay, that's right. 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 Um, that transition was a year or two away, I think, before uh, Krzyzewski came in. That winning a national championship in college is what we're looking at going on right now. That that had to be uh, one of the highlights of your life, obviously. Yeah, I mean, anytime you play a team sport, that's the ultimate goal to win a championship. And uh, the way that team really came together and, and uh, was able to accomplish the goal, because really the number one seed from the start of the season through most of the year, and then to come away with the championship, it just kind of, uh, you know, that that's that's what you're playing for, really. It's, it's not an individual game. It's a team game. And so for your team to win a championship um, – yeah, it, it was – and for me, after going through some hardships, having to transfer, sit out a year, and be able to step in and play and, and lead the team uh, made it even that much more special. And I don't remember exactly now how long this run lasted. And I think it might have started in like 73. But there was a team from either Indiana or Kentucky in the final four – for a stretch of like 11, 12, 13 years. I mean, Indiana went in uh, 73, I know. You had Kentucky going, and Louisville was was in that mix. Uh, you know, then Indiana again, and it just went back and forth. You had Indiana State in it. Uh, it just wild to, for those two states to have such a long stretch of a team in the Final Four for a, nearly a, for over a decade. A lot of good basketball in that area. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like to think that the high school basketball in Indiana is, uh, you know, one of the best in the country. And and then college basketball, obviously, with Indiana and Kentucky both uh, at that time, uh, really always high, highly ranked and playing so well. I mean, the Indiana undefeated team, uh, Kentucky knocked off to Indiana the, the one year when they would have been maybe two years in a row undefeated uh, to go to the Final Four, which ended up playing UCLA in John Wood's last game in 75 and those uh, freshmen on that team then were seniors in 78 when we won the championship and of course if we can stretch it out there because of course john wooden from martinsville indiana so uh the 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 deal just continues i don't i don't know that people really realize the the fabric how how woven it really really is they think that people from uh in this area just brag about it but it, it's a it was a true fact it is a true fact yeah, I mean, if you go back and look at the history books and the players and those type of things. But, um, you know, I, I think it was just it's such a big part of the community. It, it meant something to, you know, make the basketball team or the coach had a, a really a high character in the community and uh, was well thought of. Um, I don't know. I've not been around Indiana high school as much, obviously, since I live in Kentucky now. But when they went to the class system, that may have changed a little bit. 
Uh, it makes it a little tougher because, you know, it was such a unique situation where when you play your sectionals in high school in Indiana that, you know, you've got eight teams or so all within 20 miles of each other. And now the teams may have to travel an hour, hour and a half just to play a game in a sectional. So it's a little bit different. The crowds, I don't think, are quite as big. Uh, but, you know, the reason I guess they win is more uh, players get to experience a state championship or whatever. So. And I know that uh, with your duties, with family, with living, uh, not living here, how often do you even get to get back? to uh, Indiana, whether it's to Peru or when I saw you in Bloomington a, a month or so ago? Yeah, um, I try to get up to Indiana. Well, I have a brother still living up around the Peru area in Converse, so I'll get up, visit him. I go up uh, for a week each summer, start of the summer. Uh, my high school tennis coach is still coaching tennis in Peru, and I'll go up for a week. And my work. gosh. Yeah, and uh, so I get up there. My parents, unfortunately, have passed, so, uh, you know, don't go up and visit them. Obviously I can go to the web, the cemetery, maybe when I'm visiting my brother, but um, you know, so not as much as I used to, but still get up there. Some obviously. How good was the tennis career, man, those big lanky arms. I'm sure they, they uh, served you well. I, I was okay. I mean, I think they said, I don't, I don't know if they had ranking systems back then, but I, someone said I was maybe one of the top four in the state my senior year. So. Yeah. And we see that a lot. Uh, yeah especially with crossover athletes because great athletes are just great athletes. And it kind of, especially at the lower level, it transcends a lot of things because you're just, you're naturally better than other guys and other things. So, but how fun was it being able to play and be so good at a sport, not named basketball? <laughs> well, the, the great thing about tennis and basketball, the crossovers is, is wonderful. I mean, your footwork, your eye hand coordination and all those things really help with each sport. And, uh, I mean, I, I played baseball as well through high school and American Legion. So, um, it kind of depends, you know, growing up, uh, whatever season it is, that's the sport you're playing. <laughs> and it just worked out that I was probably better at basketball and, uh, you know, pursued that. I kind of got away from tennis in college, obviously, uh, although I did play my freshman year at Purdue in doubles after the basketball season was over. Uh, but then when I, I stopped playing professionally, I came back and, you know, you, you still have those competitive juices. So, um, to this day, I still play some uh, age group tournaments, uh, national stuff. And I think the highest I got in uh, my age group was maybe nationally, it was number 45 in the country. So, and a lot of people might not know this, but you played under your dad at Peru. That had to also be very special for you or, yeah, and, it, and taxing at the same time. You know, it, it really wasn't, um, we had a real good relationship. It, it was a great uh, opportunity for me to play. And that's why he took the Peru job. He'd been a college coach in Fort Wayne. And that's really where I grew up at Indiana Tech. And, um, but yeah, I, I got to play for him for three years. And um, I, I think if you're a son of a coach, you, you either have to be the best player on the team or the worst player on the team. I think if you're in the middle, that's <laughs> the problems. So, but no, we had a real good relationship. <laughs> take things home and talk about them. And, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, 1975, Mr. Basketball, Indiana, Mr. Basketball. And I say this all the time that is, is that has to be one of the highest, uh, high school awards that there are in the United States period. Uh, Indiana, Mr. Basketball is just, it is what it is, and it is uh, it, it's 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 something that's way up there, and I'm and I'm I'm sure that's something you still cherish. Oh yeah, I mean it's a special honor to be named Mr. Basketball of the state, um, but I think it's not just an individual honor. The way I looked at it, I mean I had a lot of real good teammates that maybe made that extra pass to give me an open shot that where my scoring average was pretty high. Uh, you know, the, we had a, a newspaper man that uh, did a lot of coverage of our team. That ob obviously helps get the publicity out there. So there's a lot of factors, I think, to come into play. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great honor. And, you know, you, you carry that title with you the rest of your life. But when you look at the list of uh, former Mr. Basketballs, I think that's really what makes it even that much more special. And for those that don't know your complete story, it's, it's vast, uh, we've been talking about just, we could stop after all the accolades we've already talked about, but that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. And many people probably don't know you actually started your college career at Purdue. Yeah, I did. Um, 
came down really with recruiting wars with uh, Purdue and Kentucky. And I was real late deciding. It was into May. You know, none of those signing when you're in eighth grade like they do nowadays sometimes. Uh, so I was late deciding. And, and Kentucky kind of gave me an ultimatum, said, hey, we need to sign one more guard. And we've got a guard ready to sign. But we, we would sign you first if you're ready. Well, I wasn't. So they went ahead and signed uh, Truman Clater, who I ended up playing with for two years, you know, after I transferred down. But I think I probably felt a little pressure to stay in state and Purdue being just an hour away from Peru. Um, so went there my freshman year. Uh, and then what led to the transfer to Kentucky? Um, a lot of things. I think you just probably the, the major factor was just a lack of discipline on the team from the coach. Uh, guys, we had a lot of talent, but just, the guys kind of came and went and did whatever they wanted to do. And so we were never going to be as good as we could have been. Um, I, I wasn't really getting to play until about the fourth game when Bruce Parkinson broke his wrist. And that kind of put me into the starting lineup. And I had a lot of success. I think I had 38 my first Big Ten game, uh, a couple other games in the 20s, whatever. So, you know, once you play and you kind of taste that, you don't want to go back to the bench. And Bruce redshirted after that uh, wrist injury and was coming back the next year. So... Um, I, I probably would have been renegated back to the bench. Uh, I guess I didn't want to take that chance after having played and had success. So I uh, looked to transfer. And, and at Kentucky, you guys had a damn good team. I mean, uh, <laughs> Goose Givens, Rick Roby. Uh, I, I can't remember them all by name right now, but uh, I do. I was a kid, and, and I remember that was really when I first started paying attention to college basketball. And knowing those names, and I remember them. my grandmother was a, a Kentucky fan. She grew up in Louisville, and so <laughs> had that damn rug that uh, they used to have with the cats on it and all that stuff. Uh, so it's funny. I look back and laugh now, but uh, and she was a Kentucky Colonel boy. She was just all proud of all that stuff, and uh, <laughs> yeah. But that was that was a hell of a team that you, that, that Kentucky had in '78. Yeah, it probably is uh, kind of underrated in, through the history books of the uh, successful national championship teams because one of the reasons I think the following year is when ESPN kicked in. And so we didn't have the coverage, you know. Uh, in fact, I think they may have even lost the film of the final game against Duke, whoever was the sponsor. I'd heard that story. I'm not sure if that's true or not to get, you know, highlights. You can't really go back and look at it. But um, – with Mike Phillips and Rick Roby on the inside, both 6'10", uh, both kind of complemented each other. Roby could really run well and was athletic. And uh, Phillips had great touch in around the basket. Uh, both could, you know, share the ball very well. And then with Given shooting on the wing and James Lee coming in off the bench, about 6'6", six, six stud. You know, Forgot just, about uh, him, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he then could jump out of the gym. Yeah, and would try to every time he got the ball go to the hole and dunk. <laughs> and then uh, Truman Clater, myself, Jay Scheidler in the backcourt. Um, yeah, we, we were pretty solid. So uh, we could yeah. we were fast, we could play slow. And Blonde Bomber, wasn't, he, wasn't that yeah. his nickname? Blonde. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's bad when the, the memory starts getting kicked in. Us, we have one of the uh, all time greats, uh, Kyle Macy, former uh, Peru, Indiana native, who uh, started his College career, he was former Mr. Basketball in Indiana 1975, started his college career at Purdue, went on to Kentucky, won a national championship, uh, played in the NBA for the Phoenix Suns and the Bulls and the Pacers, and also coached at Moorhead State. So you've done about everything there is to do, in, and now you work in the media. So I'd say you've done everything that there is possibly to do in uh, in the game of basketball, man. Hey, I even went overseas and played in Italy for three years. So that was a enjoyable <laughs> experience. <laughs> and uh, a Pan Am gold medal win winner. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, you... coach, coach Knight was the coach of that team. And uh, yeah. Oh, was that the That's right. The 79 Pan Am. Yeah. Yeah. With the police incident. Yeah. Were you there? Were you there uh, holding the, the cop back? So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was there. Uh, yeah. I saw it all. <laughs> oh, did you really? Oh, yeah. We were at practice. It, it was interesting. Um, at the end of each practice, we had an hour to practice. I think it was going into the, I don't know, maybe we just come out of pool play maybe. And uh, we had about an hour to practice. So Coach Knight would always take the last 15 minutes of the hour and go over scouting reports. You had your own little notebook, and you wrote down your own scouting report. It wasn't a handout sheet you just read or, you know, threw aside. You, you took your own notes. So we're at the end of the, the 
the uh, court, which is like an old uh, elementary school was a stage, like the old days and yep. sitting around the stage, whatever, as he's walking through stuff. And, um, when we had come in, it had been pouring down rain. When we originally came into practice, they said, no, you can't come in the gym. You got to go sit back out on the bus. So we went back on the bus. So as we're practicing, I think it was the uh, Canadian women's team was coming in after us and they came in and they got pretty loud and coach Knight just, uh, turned to coach Krzyzewski, who was assistant and said, you know, go down there and ask them to be quiet. And so, <laughs> so they, they quieted down for a couple minutes. Then eventually the, the level came back up pretty high. And so finally coach said, just turn or wheeled around and said, I don't care if you're in there, just shut up. And uh, so when that happened, that's when the, the policeman came running down the court, like he was the boss in charge and, you know, coach couldn't say that. So they kind of squared off face to face and, you know, pointing fingers. And when he did, he, I guess got coach in the eye and kind of fell back when you did, you just, you know, instinctively that arm went up and kind of pushed away. And, uh, so they arrested coach Knight right there. Fred Taylor was our general manager and, uh, it was a Catholic elementary school we were at and he's like making the motion to the nun to, to use the telephone to try to find out where they're taking him and everything. And really from then on, we didn't see coach Knight much, uh, other than at the game time. And, um, you know, we, one time we waited like a half hour in the bus for him to get from the courtroom to the bus to go to the gym to, to play the game. And uh, unfortunately for me, and I guess fortunately maybe for Isaiah, um, I got my jaw broke. And, and the reason I say fortunate for Isaiah, because he and Coach Knight just hadn't gotten along the whole tournament. And in fact, when all that incident happened, Isaiah was already out on the bus. He'd been kicked out of practice for about the third time. <laughs> and it had been told, you might as well just transfer to DePaul. You'll never pray for me at IU and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so when I, I got my jaw broke, we were playing Cuba. We'd beaten them by 40 in the, the uh, pool play. And it was maybe the uh, quarterfinals or semifinal round. And we were up 20, going to go to 40 again at the end of the game. And just to start the second half, and I don't know why they picked me, but I passed to my left and turned to my right. The guy hit me in the jaw and broke my mandible up here. So I, I was on a plane heading home the next morning. Uh, wow. And so that's when Isaiah, all that stuff was kind of forgotten. Coach Knight really wasn't around much for practices. And uh, kind of the rest is history in IU basketball. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, I had never heard that in, in depth uh, of that story, but it's wild. But what was it like? playing for him did you get to enough of experience to to truly have an understanding of what it was like playing for him oh yeah we were in bloomington about a month that summer getting ready and we took a trip to uh, italy to play some games to, to practice for the games um i enjoyed it i mean i uh you know as long as you did what he expected you to do and wanted you to do and gave that effort i, I didn't have any problems with him at all the only time he ever really got on me um Kevin McHale and I were, it was into practice. We were shooting free throws and coach Knight got sidetracked kind of by this reporter and was, was talking and we must've shot close to a half hour free throws, which you know, I always took a lot of pride in my free throws, whatever. So after a while, I don't know if you know Kevin McHale, but he's, he's got a good sense of humor. We started banking in the free throws and coach I bet, <laughs> caught that out of the side of his eye, I guess. And, you know, that, but after 30 minutes of free throws, you, you, <laughs> your mind got a little bored. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, he did, he did something I thought was really nice and he didn't really have to do, but I, I, it meant a lot to me that he did uh, two things. One, he came up to me at one of the practices and said, you know, looking back in hindsight, he said, if I had to do it over again, I would have recruited you a lot harder because he really didn't. I mean, they had Buckner, Wilkerson, Wisman, Cruz, and they signed Bob Bender. So he didn't really recruit me that hard. And then the other thing was when we won the gold medal, he brought that gold medal down to Lexington and, and gave it to me uh, when I, you know, we still have my, my mouth wired shut. So that, that was awful nice of him. That was crazy. But it did show the talent that they had because Terry Stotts was a Bloomington native, uh, an Indiana all-star in 76, uh, and did not play for Indiana. You know, he ended up in Oklahoma uh, but, and you also had Larry Bird who had a very brief, uh, career at Indiana about, uh, weeks to a month, I think. Was Bird any good as a player? Or is he? Uh, I, I've heard rumors <laughs> that he did okay. Um, uh, but I, it gets you to think it's like, man, he would have been on the 75 team when, when, uh, uh Scott may broke his arm. 
Don't know if that would have made enough of a difference because they they had beaten Kentucky by 20 that season and but ended up losing to Kentucky in the tournament, uh, like 92-90. And but 77 and 78, they weren't that good, even though in 77 they still had uh Keaton Benson. But I'm like, man, if you had Bird and Benson, I'm like, holy crap, because look what Bird did at Indiana State by himself, basically. Yeah, you know, it was funny. I was in uh in Market Square Arena watching the state finals at uh, high school that year that Kentucky and Indiana uh, squared off at Dayton within a 92-90 game. And the score, they had the score up on the, the side, and most of the fans obviously were watching the scoreboard. And it was 90-90 for the longest time. And then all of a sudden it flashed 92-90 final. And it was like air was taken out of Mark Square Arena. Everybody's like, ah! they, you know, they just couldn't believe the IU lost. <laughs> so, but that, that was, and I'll remember that as so. But what a uh, time for college basketball. I mean, those were some great teams, and I mean with greats on them that we still talk about today. The, the fact that I didn't realize that McHale was on that 79 team, I guess I have to go back and look, uh, but it's wild to think that he was on that team. Uh, so, again, you're looking at the genesis of how many NBA titles were on that daggone team. Yeah, it was a really good team. Um before the professionals started playing, they said that was one of the best international teams the U.S. had ever fielded. Um, you had Mikhail, you had Mike Woodson from IU was on the team, Isaiah, obviously. Um, uh, Danny Brains played out west at Utah. Um, John Duran from Georgetown, uh, Lester from Iowa, uh, that were the guards, myself. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it was a solid team, and uh, we, we pretty much dominated the, the games, so. Uh, John commenting says that uh, Kyle beat him out for Mr. Basketball in, in 1975. There were probably only about 300 or so players in between you two. So, <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on that, John. But uh, and so now you've you've moved on to the media. How fun is that to do to to be able to stay in the game, uh, stay a part of the game, and and act and be active as you are. I enjoy it. You're right. It keeps you around the game. Uh, the thing I may enjoy the most is going in the day early and going to practices, getting to talk to the coaches, and just watch and see what teams do to prepare for for the opponents. Um, but obviously, you get good seats most of the time for the games. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 a lot of fun. I I, I worked for Kentucky's uh, network for about four years when I first stopped playing, and then uh, before I took the head coaching job at Moorhead State. And so um, that was fun, too, where you're covering one team because then you, your prep is pretty easy. You know that team so well. All you really have to prep is for the opponent. But, uh, yeah, I'm more independent worker now where I do games all over, uh, whatever I can pick up. And uh, But it, it's fun to see different styles of different parts of the country. And uh, just, you know, being a basketball fan, I'm kind of a junkie. I enjoy basketball, obviously. And the greatest series in the in the country to me, Indiana and Kentucky, which we have not had for a couple of years. But even though that hasn't happened, it doesn't matter. The uh, the rivalry has lost zero. It is just as strong during a time, at least from this side. I know I, I, I can see the fans. It there is no loss. It's still right there, waiting. It's like a volcano. It's just waiting to erupt, and then we have the series coming back here in another year or so. And right. which, which, as it should be, that is that's something that should always be there. The, uh, the irony here is both fan bases, probably the two most passionate fan bases in college basketball, both uh, not happy with their coaches uh, after this <laughs> season, both just lighting up the, the boards. And uh, but both coaches coming back, Mike Woodson and John Calipari coming back next year to go at it again. I know that John has got a hell of a recruiting class coming in, but that's been part of the, the issue that he seemed to acknowledge that maybe, all right, I've got to find a mix of this youth and something else. Uh, and then, of course, Mike Woodson didn't have enough, didn't probably uh, have a good enough recruiting uh, system going on. Although here of late, they're really getting on that. They just landed a McDonald's all American yesterday, day before that, but this is a great series and I'm glad to see this coming back. Yeah. I think all the fans are, um, you know, coaches needed to put their egos aside and get that series worked out. Um, because it is to uh, the blue bloods, if you will, of college basketball, and they need to play being border States, 
Uh, and, and, you know, there were some great rivalry games when locations. I remember the RCA Dome when they like half the building was blue and the other half was red. Yes. And, uh, so, that, and Freedom Hall the same way. Right, right. And, uh, and I it, remember. You know, Kentucky doesn't play a lot of uh, big schools at home. Uh, it doesn't seem like on their schedule. Most of those games are neutral sites. And, and, you know, that may be one reason that they struggle some in the tournament because you learn so much when you go on the road and play a team about your team, how they're going to react in hostile environments or pressure situations. And um, But I think the one thing that Kentucky fans are more upset about than anything um, is, yes, they have a young team every year. They reload every year. You have to relearn the roster every year, which is fine. But don't use that as an excuse at the end of the year when you get beat that, oh, well, we're pretty young. We're playing against 22, 23-year-olds because, you know, that's the route you've chosen to put your team together. Uh, and the other thing is that I think some of the Kentucky fans are a little bit tired of the, you know, we're here to change players' lives and get them in the NBA and big contracts as opposed to the goal is to win a national championship. And so we'll see if those changes are made. Yeah, there's a similar uh, situation in Indiana. The the fans, they want to see, because Indiana produces probably more talent than any other state that there is, especially per capita, uh, they want to see Indiana kids on the, on the roster. Uh, and I understand that because that's how it used to be. But there have been so many changes that I think that there's a way to do that still because ironically, through this portal, it's very possible Indiana will end up bringing a couple of guys back that are from the state of Indiana, guys like Tony Perkins, who played at Indiana, uh, at Iowa, uh, uh, Leland Walker, who played at Eastern Kentucky at Richmond. Uh, but there's different guys. But it, it's been it's going to be different, period. It's not the way it used to be. And I think that now fans are just going to have to look at, at, at best, uh, instead of the four-year group that they were used to having, it's going to be a maximum of like a two-year thing to where you might have a guy for two years, maybe, if he's not a one-and-done. You know, I, I don't really know how coaches do it nowadays with the transfer portal where, you know, you worked hard to get a kid playing better and, and improve his skills, and then if he's – got a better offer he's just going to leave because there's really no loyalty it doesn't seem like in college basketball anymore you know it used to be the fans were loyal to your school and the players were loyal to your fans in your school as well but now if they feel like they got a better deal they're going to jump and so you don't really know who who's coming back who's you know what spots are open you need to recruit to until maybe the end of the season it, it's got to be really tough as a head coach yeah uh recruit biggest recruiting issue now is retention yeah uh, yeah, you, which is you recruit crazy. not only kids, but you recruit your own kids. Exactly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And NIL, I asked you off uh, off air. Can you imagine uh, how well not just yourself, but uh, your teammates and many others would have done it on the on the NIL front back in the day? <laughs> I, I think I might have had a deal or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, uh, and it would have been uh, good for for those guys. Uh, quickly before we uh, let you go, the NCAA tournament last night, four games, three of them just incredible, fun to watch. The other one, uh, that juggernaut that is UConn, that is virtually everyone's favorite to win, and with good reason, they lose 75% of their offense, three starters to the NBA, and they're back to do it again, uh, unbelievably. Uh, they just obliterated San Diego State, winning by 30 uh, then you've got four more games tonight. I don't know if Purdue is the only team that might have a chance only because they're so different than uh, everybody else. Alabama's a little different because they really rely on the three, but Purdue is different just because of Zach Eady. He's, uh, he's an anomaly. Yeah, and that's the big question. Excuse me. <clears throat> Purdue uh, is kind of old school back. Ball with the big center in the middle. You know, nowadays the game is kind of extended out on the floor. You don't see a lot of teams with that dominating big man. Um, and I guess the question always is, uh, you know, how will the guards hold up under pressure? And uh, you know, I think they're it's a good matchup with for Purdue with Gonzaga, but I, I think they lead into Houston next round if Houston uh, wins their game with Duke. Uh, Houston's a tough team, physical team. And they can uh, apply some pressure out on the perimeter. So that will be the game, uh, maybe the, the real uh, contest. But, you know, the way Connecticut's playing, I mean, it's, it is basically who's playing for second, third. 
because they're they're dominating. I mean, they're big, they're fast, they shoot well, they're well coached, they play defense, uh, and that's been the key for Alabama. They've always been able to score, but now they decided maybe to try to play a little bit of defense, and if they do, then they've got a chance against some of these teams. Terrence Shannon Jr. for Illinois last night. They win uh, a big game over Iowa State. The number one offense against the number two D or number one defense last night. Uh, Illinois winning that battle. Now they'll go against UConn, the top two offenses in the country, and they probably Illinois probably has the top player to me, the best player in the country, and Terrence Shannon Jr. Uh, he's averaging nearly 24 points a game, which is the most for an Illinois player since the seventies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was kind of tough too, for, uh, San Diego state to have to travel all the way from California to what Boston they were playing. Oh yeah, that's Connecticut right. Connecticut could ride their bike to the game if they wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously a home court advantage, I think, but, uh, yeah, it's right now it looks like it's a one team show but you never know that's week to week you have that clunker game and you're out the door so